Today we begin a new series of videos in which we are going to navigate our way through the Montessori shelves, starting with practical life, moving to sensorial, zoology, botany, geography, history, language and math. I'm going to go on this journey with you and we're going to look at the Montessori shelves a little bit closer. Normally we talk about materials, we discuss philosophy, we discuss some Montessori uh, principles and you know how to hand handle behavior in a Montessori way. But this is a little bit different. We want to help you to achieve maximum Montessori success, whether you're doing this at home or in school. So I'll be starting with one area at a time. We're going to understand what it takes to put our shelves together how we can add extensions, variations, understand the principles behind it. I have a lot of tips, tools and tricks for you that come from years and years of experience, from us making mistakes, learning how to overcome those so that we make it easier for you. We, you know, smoothen this path for you so you can achieve success faster and easier. So stay tuned. Make sure that you keep coming back week after week because, as always, we're going to learn and grow together in Montessori. So we're going to begin with the easiest place to start, which is practical life. Now, I know a lot of people already have practical life areas set up at home, at school, but I'm going to take you through all the nitty gritty steps, all the rules and the principles that we have in setting up a practical life shelf at home. Practical life area is unlike all the other areas in the Montessori classroom in that we don't actually have to go to a supplier to buy pretty much all of these materials except for maybe the dressing frames. These are things that we as teachers, Montessori guides and parents, we put them together ourselves. That's why it's really, really for, uh, important for us to understand very well what it entails and how to lay it out so that we're doing it absolutely right. That's what I'm here for. That's what we're going to do today. And you are going to leave this session. You're going to finish watching this video and you'll be loaded up with so many ideas to get started. The other thing that makes the practical life area unique is that it's constantly changing. This is what it may look like today. But in a month, it's going to look completely different based on our themes, based on the festivals or the celebrations that are ongoing at that time. We would keep changing this so that our children keep coming back to it. We want them to continue to do practical life over and over and over again. Many, many people think that, oh, practical life is something the little ones do the two to three year olds, the five year olds shouldn't be doing this, they should be doing math, they should be doing the sciences or language, you know, things like that. But that's not the way it works. When we have a Montessori work cycle, children come in in the morning, all ages, they don't straight away get into very intense work. We've talked about the work cycle. It takes time to build up, all right, that level of concentration, that depth of con concentration, and how do we build it? With these kind of activities. Even the five-year-olds, they want to come and do something that doesn't require too much effort the first thing in the morning. And if you make your practical life materials exciting enough, they will come back. There's a sense of calm that comes to the children when they do these activities. It gets, you know, their physical needs satisfied, their emotional needs satisfied, and that's the energy they will take on through the rest of the day. So it's up to you to make this area alive and exciting. Don't worry, don't think it's a lot of pressure because I'm going to make it easy for you. I'm going to tell you exactly what you have to do. Let's start with one of the most important things and the easiest thing to do. Order. Your area, not just practical life, but the whole classroom has to have a sense of order. Children between the ages of two and six are in the sensitive period for order. That means they will thrive in an environment that provides them a very orderly feeling. Everything that means 
on one level it means that everything has its place so they come in and there's a familiarity to that whole environment i know where everything is children are like this they wake up in the morning and they think mm, i'm going to go to school and i'm going to transfer with the tongs today and they know exactly where it is and they will go right to it and it should always be there every day and this satisfies their need for order okay now let's say you know at the end of the day obviously things get mixed up their children at the, you know after all it's our job as teachers to make sure that everything goes back to its place because when that child comes in the morning and he's thinking i want to do my transferring with the tongs and he goes and it's not there that you know internal sense of order of his is disrupted something gets upset inside he could go completely quiet he could you know get mildly irritated or deeply irritated or throw a tantrum or get upset that which he's used to that comfort level from that order of the environment gets upset all right and that you know tends to disrupt everything in our environment so order is a big big uh, factor of your practical life shelf now if you have a look at our shelves over here you can see how orderly everything is all of our trays are neat and in a row this way and also neatly placed this way all right apart from just appearing orderly there is a sense of order to the materials themselves okay now we have on the top shelf we have all the spooning activities over here we have all the dry pouring activities then we have wet pouring transferring pegging opening and closing and so on okay now it starts with the easiest on the left hand side and it move moves towards more difficult so we start with spooning from one bowl to another bowl spooning from one bowl to two equal bowls spooning from one bowl to two unequal bowls and spooning into a bowl with an indicator line so it's progressively getting more difficult as we move from left to right it also gets more progressively difficult as we go from top to bottom this is the easiest set of materials and then we have dry pouring and from dry pouring we progress towards wet pouring and transferring and so on okay now these materials are for a 2 to 3 year old then 3 to 4 year old 4 onwards sorry 3 to 3 to 3 and a half 3 and a half to 4 4 onwards so it is organized in a very very orderly way you have children who you know come in and they'll say but you know he's two years old but i want to do that and slowly and steadily we guide them into understanding that in order to get here they've got to finish all of these things first just like their other older friends are doing so this also helps them to build that understanding of the order that we have to the layout of the materials now this is something that runs through the whole classroom it's, it isn't exclusive to practical life it's something that we have in in all the areas the five areas of the classroom and when we explore the other areas in the coming months you'll see how that works as well okay still on the topic of order when children have this external sense of order then internally they feel calm and they feel safe so it's really important whether you're doing uh, Montessori at school or you are doing Montessori at home everything has got to have its place to give your children that sense of security why do you think it is that when children come to school for the first time ever they're tantruming they're crying they're weeping everything that's familiar from for them just doesn't exist anymore they've come to a brand new place a brand new person brand new children brand new environment okay but when they come here every day and they see that everything is in its place, they begin to trust this environment. And that's what helps them build a sense of security and belonging to this space. The other thing that you need to make sure of when you are setting up your practical life shelves is that you're using items that are child sized. Now, this is something that I've seen a lot of people struggle with. They ask a lot of questions when uh, you know we're doing the training course. They ask me, but what is child size really? Think about it and uh, in, from this point of view, 
if a child were to handle this spoon, would he feel comfortable or would he struggle? If a child had to hold this jug, would it be too heavy for him? Would he be having a challenging time pouring the water? I've seen people use very tall jugs, okay? And the child cannot, you know, comfortably sit on a table and do a pouring activity. They'd have to stand up to do it. Right there and then is a red flag for you. This is not child-sized. Child size means it's something that comfortably fits in a child's hands, okay? So that brings me to the second point. Just because it's child size does not mean that it should be a toy or a pretend thing. I don't want you to go out and bring a toy tea set or, you know, toy cups and things like that to put on your shelves. It's got to be real materials, things that we would actually use in our kitchen. All right. That's when the activity becomes meaningful to the children. If you put toys in there and pretend stuff, they know. Trust me, they get that. No, this is not a real activity and it doesn't feel meaningful to them. And they're not attracted to do to use that material. They want to do the things we do. You may look at this as, oh, that's just spooning. That's just boring. I mean, how boring is that? But for a child, he feels, wow, I get to do this real work. They enjoy it way more than playing with toys, all right? So make sure that you've got real items. That does not mean you have to have glass to start with, okay? Glass, yes, I know, can be, you know, hard to work with. You don't want children to be having a lot of breakages. It's dangerous. It's expensive. Start with real things that are not breakable. So you can have steel. We have melamine. Um, you can have wood, okay? You get a lot of uh, wooden things that are very, very beautiful as well. Um, there are so many different kinds of materials that you can work with that are not breakable. When you see your children are developing a sense of control, a sense of balance, a sense of, sense of understanding how to tidy up, slowly you make things more difficult and you add in the glass. So apart from having child-sized items, and real items, you also want to make sure that everything is beautiful and harmonized, okay? We want to make sure that it looks very beautiful when we have a look at this shelf. If you see our shelves, everything is matching and color-coded. The minute you look at it, you feel a sense of peace, isn't it? I hear so many people say that, you know, a whole sense, a different sense washes over them when they enter of a Montessori classroom. It's just the way everything is harmonized. You'll see all the spooning activities are matching. It's just one thing that changes. We have spooning from one bowl to another, and then it changes to two identical bowls, two unidentical bowls, and then a bowl with an indicator line. Or we have dry pouring from jug to jug, dry pouring from one jug to two equal jugs, to two, two unequal containers and to a container with an indicator line. So just one thing changes, but otherwise they are identical amongst themselves. Now what some people might think is OCD, but if you look at all our spoons, they face one direction. If you look at the way our jugs are placed, if it's two jugs, they face each other. If it's one jug, it's all facing towards the left. It's at the same kind of angle. I know it sounds pretty intense, okay? But I promise you, if one of these things was just turned another way, it would change the whole harmony of this shelf. The minute you look at it, something looks off, all right? Now, that's just not me as a teacher singularly, but all Montessori teachers will set up their shelves like this. And what you see will happen is that the children will notice when things are out of place and they come and they straighten it and they put things in place. They take on this sense of order and beauty and harmony and they want to maintain it. And that's brilliant, isn't it? That from a, such a young age, they care about the way things look. When things are so beautiful and harmonized and matching, it also helps to develop this appreciation for beauty. Children start to develop an aesthetic sense. It lends to later creativity and imagination. When you see beautiful things and you develop an appreciation for that, that's what helps you to develop creativity and imagination. 
they're inborn, they're inside us, something needs to give rise to it. I hear so many people, you know, students will come and they'll say, oh, Jenny, I have not a single creative bone. I cannot do anything. I'm not able to make anything. But it's inside all of us. It's just that we need to be surrounded by beauty for it to come up and to be, you know, woken up inside us. So like I said to you, the practical life shells are constantly changing. They're constantly growing. This is what it looks like. But maybe next month it's going to be, you know, uh, another festival. It could be maybe a Chinese New Year. And in that case, I would add a lot of red elements in here. I would find uh, containers that have, you know, Chinese designs on them and place them here on the shelves. And what happens is that the children who have been used to this for one month, suddenly they come in and everything looks brand new. Now it's still going to be dry pouring or wet pouring or spooning or transferring, but now it's just new items. They are attracted again that they want to touch this. Wow, this looks fun. I've never worked with this. How pretty is this? How cute is that? And they will come and they'll work with it again. They will continue to refine the skills that still need to be refined. They will continue to build that concentration that still needs to go deeper. This means that you, as a Montessori guide, have to have a very creative, imaginative mind as well to set up things in a beautiful way that every time you go out, you will be in the supermarket or you'll be in a, the mall or the store and you'll see something and you'll say, that's going to be perfect for my practical life area. Those tongs are just right and they've got, you know, a beautiful little red flower on the end or this little ice tray would work perfectly for, you know, when it's spring or these little pom-poms. Your mind starts working in that way and you will be able to spot things anywhere that will fit onto your practical life shelves. A great idea is to incorporate the culture of the country that you live in onto the shelves. We live in Indonesia. Uh, a lot of the things we put on the shelves at times are made from coconut wood because we have dishes and spoons and trays. And as you can see, we have these baskets. So we use a lot of that on our shelves and um, they're you know very easy to access not only that it's also very affordable and it teaches children about the, the different things that we have in the country that we come from so ours is a training room and uh, this is a classroom that is not used by children but it is used by teachers where they come to uh, train to become qualified Montessori directors or directresses so we have a large variety of each activity which you wouldn't necessarily need in your home or in your schools. You could have one or two spooning activities, one or two uh, dry pouring, one wet pouring and so on. You can pick and choose and then when you see the children have mastered this, then you can go on and change it up for something more difficult and more challenging. Keep in mind that even if a particular material is super popular amongst all the children, we do not keep multiples of those. For example, if you find that all the children just want to use transferring water with a sponge or transferring water with a turkey baster, that doesn't mean that you're going to put a double of that so that the children don't have to share. All our materials are limited in quantity. That means there's only one. And there's a really big reason behind this, okay? We want the children to learn how to share, to cooperate, to take turns, to problem solve. Today, Mary and John come. Both of them want to use the dry pouring activity. Obviously, only one person can use it. Let them collaborate. Stand back and watch them. Let them reach a decision Maybe I use it first and you use it next or vice versa or, you know, we sit together and we do something together. Let them reach their decisions in an amicable way. If you feel at some point that, you know, it's not going well, they might, you know, get aggressive or something. That's when you can step in. If they're not even able to reach some kind of a solution themselves, you can offer them suggestions. Maybe they're too young and they can't problem solve themselves. You can offer them a suggestion. Would you like to you know, take turns? Who would like to go first? Or would you like to work together? 
and see how they go about it. This is what makes Montessori so beautiful is because in this way they learn the social skills that otherwise in you know, non-Montessori schools and conventional schools, we kind of have to stage it for them. We kind of have to set up role plays and situations where we have to teach them to share or to socialize or to learn how to solve problems with between one another. Whereas in this classroom, it happens in a very, very natural way. The material should always be kept in the reach of the child. There should never be a point where the child has to come to you and say, you know, teacher, can you please carry this for me? Can you give this to me? I cannot reach it, all right? We are here to develop independence. Let's make that possible for the children. Let's keep everything within their reach. Now, apart from being within their reach, the material should always be available for them when they need it. Uh, because this is what takes them to that state of normalization, all right? Like I said to you before, children think from home, what is it I want to do? And they come to school and they, they seek out that activity, they look for it, okay? Now, you've decided today, I've got this activity on the shelves which is peeling carrots, but today I just don't have carrots. I didn't manage to get any carrots for whatever reason, and it's just not there on the shelf. This child comes to school, he's already thought in his mind, I want to peel some carrots and then I'm going to give it to the kitchen and they're going to make something for us. And he comes to school and there are no carrots. And now he's just upset, all right? Most of the time, if it's you know a younger child, they don't even know how to express to you what they're feeling. And then that manifests in behavior that we term as you know bad behavior or naughtiness some people will call it they might have a tantrum they might go completely quiet it could go either way so you've got to make sure that you know whatever is on your shelves it remains constant all the time let me give you an example okay now we had a bunch of toddlers in a classroom and they would come to the classroom every day and they would take the brooms and the mops and the feather dusters and they would clean now there was nothing to clean the first thing in the morning but this was satisfying some need of theirs to move to get those gross motor skills going and they would sweep and mop and dust for just the longest time and the teacher really tried to guide them towards other activities but it wasn't working and so one day she decided you know what i'm going to do how about if i just take this you know rack with all the cleaning equipment and put it away in a cupboard if it's not there they just won't you know be able to do it they'll move on to something else but it really didn't go the way she imagined that morning there was just so much chaos in that room there was a lot of crying there were a lot of children just sitting and doing nothing wandering about aimlessly and she couldn't put two and two together now, I was the supervisor of the school at that time, and afterwards we talked about it, you know, what do you think went wrong? Because she was really wondering, you know, why? Normally my children are, you know, they're doing their thing, we don't have this kind of a situation, why is this happening? And we talked about a lot of things, and then it came down to this, that she had taken away the rack of cleaning equipment. These children obviously still needed that, and it's fine. When they have had enough of it, they will let it go. Trust me, they will be done with it. But what can we do as parents and as teachers is that we can make the activity more challenging. We can give them rose petals to sweep. We can give them a broom that's slightly different. We can guide them towards an activity that an area that actually needs dusting. That's our job as the Montessori guide to watch and see what is our child enjoying what are they struggling with and build on that. So another question I get a lot is, how do I know what to put on the shelves? How do I know what to place and when to change it? It all comes down to observation. If your child is working independently and navigating his way through the materials, then all that remains for you to do is to observe, watch my child and see what is he really enjoying of all the things that I put on the shelf for him? If he's enjoying this so much, how can I build on it and make it a little bit more challenging? How can I vary it? What is he struggling with? 
and how can I help him? Do I need to give him a material that's a little bit easier than this to help him overcome that and then he'll be ready for the next activity? So you really have to observe and see. You may also notice that there are some materials your child is just not touching. Why? Is it because it's too difficult? Is it because he's not ready? Is it because he's just not interested in that kind of an activity? You don't have to take it personally. It's not about you. For whatever reasons, they are just not ready for that at the time. Put it away and try again later and then observe again and see what's happening. It is really very important for us as Montessori guides. It doesn't matter how many years we've been doing this. But when we make a new material, we have got to test it out. Even if it looks perfect, even in our minds we think it's perfect, we've got to test it out, okay? Sometimes what looks, you know, absolutely okay to us when the child does it, it goes completely wrong, all right? Let me give you an example. Some years ago, I was teaching a workshop in this really great school. The materials were so beautiful and um, I reached there a little bit late. I got stuck in traffic and I got there and everybody was waiting for me, seated for the workshop to start and I went straight into presenting without checking the materials. Bad move on my part, okay? I know better than that, but I was flustered for whatever reasons. I went straight into presenting. First material I have to present is spooning from one bowl to another. The material was stunning. It was spring, everything was mint green and pastel lilacs and pinks and all these very soothing colors and I picked up this material that was spooning these little Easter color buttons from one bowl to another bowl. And I started spooning and everything's going well and we're down to the last five buttons. Now these buttons, the way they were shaped, they kind of just fit into the shape of the bowl. And no matter what I did, I could not scoop those buttons. I'm a grown woman. I should be able to spoon, right? But I couldn't do it. I kept trying and they would slip back into the bowl. There was no friction. It was just not working, all right? In the end, I had to take those buttons and pour them, which is not the way the presentation is done. I was getting flustered. Oh my God, these people are watching me. They're going to wonder, what is she doing? She's supposed to be an experienced teacher. It just didn't work. The material was beautiful, but those buttons were not right. Now for me, I could understand and figure out what was happening, why this was not working. But for a child, they are going to get very frustrated. They're going to feel, why can't I do this? What's wrong with me? Where am I going wrong? Not realizing that it's the fault lies in the material. When they get frustrated, they may lose their temper. They may cry. We don't want that, right? And whose fault was it? It was the teacher's. It was never the child's fault. So you've got to got to try it, okay? Another example is uh, one of the projects I gave, you know, in class was that my students should prepare and present practical life material that incorporates something from another culture. So somebody came in with this material that was made of steel glasses. It was a spooning activity, steel bowls, and they had filled it with red kidney beans. Um, and, you know, they filled it to the brim and they had not tested the material. The minute they put that spoon into the bowl, all the beans overflowed and they were on the tray and there was a big mess. And you could see on the teacher's face, the one who was presenting, sorry, the student, immediately her face went, she realized that, what am I going to do? On my first scoop, I've made a mess. So for the child as well, not saying that they shouldn't make messes, it's fine, okay? But you must test your material and limit those, you know, mistakes. It's fine if they spill, but it shouldn't happen in ways like this. Let's always remember that we are not here to stress our children or ourselves, okay? I really want you to enjoy this process. Montessori is fun, it's enjoyable. So when you do set up your shelf and things are not going the way you imagined they would go, it's not a big deal, it's okay. You are here to observe, you are here to watch your child and their interaction and figure out 
how you can improve and both of you are here to grow not just your child okay so don't get flustered don't get stressed out go with the flow see what's working and build on that see what's not working put it away and see how you can improve it I'd like to talk a little bit about variations and extensions this is really really an important part of practical life so on some months we may have spooning activities with pasta then we may move to rice and then we may move to beans you've got to keep varying the things the spoons may change the jugs may change these things constantly keep the children interested and they also add on a little bit of a challenging effect to it okay now here's a mistake that a lot of people make they vary the activities and they stop there they do not extend it all right what that means is that you've got to take the skill that's learned through this material off the shelf and apply it in your day-to-day -day life that is extending an activity so that means you know if my child is working on spooning I've got to give her some practice in a day-to-day -day activity if I'm in school then we can you know have spooning into dishes and let them serve food or scooping soil into cups when we're doing a planting activity something to practice that skill if we are learning pegging then I can let them hang little napkins up on a clothesline basically we've we've got to extend the activities do not make them feel that this is just something I do on the shelves or this is just something I do in school they've got to see that these same skills are practiced in our everyday lives there are a couple of tips all right when you start out with your practical life shell uh, at home or even in, even in school you're not going to just fill it up with everything on day one all right you want to take your time and lay out materials gradually put in some of their toys all right in the beginning because otherwise you're going to have a mess all over the place so have you know things that they are used to but lay it out in a very orderly way okay and you know as you you introduce one material at a time as you see that they are able to take this material use a mat put it back where it com uh, came from complete a work cycle then you introduce another one do not flood them with too much it's overwhelming for them it's overwhelming for you when you are starting with practical life activities please don't do spooning of rice um, don't do dry pouring of rice because it's very messy we normally use rice when the child is older and they're able to clean up little messes by themselves you want to start with something bigger so that when there is spillage because there will be spillage they can pick it up with their fingers and tidy up otherwise it's going to lead to a lot of frustration on their part and your part dealing with a very big mess in your room you also want to start with quantities that are not too much so don't have very big bowls have small bowls so that when the child is spooning it just takes maybe three scoops from one side and three back to the other so that when you're presenting you know they don't feel like oh my god I just want to do them this why do I have to watch her they're not losing patience with that all right when they do it as well they're able to finish quickly because remember they're starting out they're just about two their concentration span is very little as you see that they have deeper concentration the concentration is increasing then you can add more quantities and bigger bowls take it very very gradually it really boils down to observe 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 all through this classroom that's what is going to show you where my child is at where does he need to go uh, how can I build on this sometimes when your children don't connect with the material look into what their interest actually is okay what does my child enjoy do they love cars do they like dinosaurs do they like flowers how can I connect my child's interest onto these shelves can I make a threading activity with flowers? Can I make a washing activity with toy cars? Um, you know, can I have uh, thread, uh, lacing cards of dinosaurs? 
connect your child's interest to a practical life material. Eventually, they will connect with the material and that interest will not really matter anymore. Okay, but the only way you're going to get there is through observing. All right, it is a work in progress. We are a work in progress, all of us. All right, so let's enjoy the journey. Try it out. Let me know in the comments below if you have tried something and it's worked for you. Let me also know how, you know, if you have any questions and any struggles, I'm happy to answer your questions. Let's continue to learn and grow together. We will come back to teach you about another area very soon in the future. So make sure you're subscribed and turn on the notifications. And if you have enjoyed this video, let me know by hitting the like button. Until we meet again, have a beautiful day.